the reading the reading this morning is from John chapter 20 verses 19 to 31 Jesus appears to his disciples on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the, fa- as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said, Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God, Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Let's reach out your hand. Let's bless and ask God to anoint and be with us. So, Father God, we just thank you for Leslie, for all that she does at Christ Church. Thank you, Lord, for this word that you've placed on her heart. Thank you for her time and preparation for this week, that your spirit has been working in her a long time. <laughs> so, Lord, I just pray that you would just continue to anoint her, Lord. She's speaking boldness, Lord. Yes. She has your word in her. And Lord, we pray for each one of us, Lord, that we would receive what you have to say. And our ears be open and our hearts softened to you. Mm. Lord, we give you thanks. Amen. Good morning. I'm going to attempt to do this today without my glasses. Do you know what? I'm getting to that stage where I really do need to buy a Bible with large print. But I'm resisting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good idea. Um, On the foyer table today, there are some reflection notes if you want to take them. I want to start by doing something a bit different today. We're just going to take a few minutes to turn to somebody near to you and just ask them what sort of a week they've had. Don't 
Don't all rush into it. Take your time. <laughs>
If they were not fearful and confused enough, here was Jesus suddenly in the middle of them. I wonder what the anxiety levels were like. I wonder what the looks on their faces were. His first words were, peace be with you. And that would have been a greeting that they were familiar with. He showed them his hands. And he showed them his sight. Can you imagine? Scripture says that they rejoiced, so it appears to be instant with them, doesn't it? It's interesting that he came to them, not just supernaturally, in a kind of a body that they could see for themselves was the result of the resurrection, but he came to them personally in order to reassure them. He came back to them as they would have known him. And there are four events that unfold here. One is the appearance of Jesus. The second is that a commissioning took place. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Jesus was sent into the world to reveal the Father, to teach and to gather disciples. After his return to the Father, he was going to send his disciples out to continue his ministry. And that's what's being fulfilled here. The gift of the Holy Spirit was bestowed upon them. It says that Jesus breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. They were immediately commissioned and given the power of the Holy Spirit so that that would, they, that would enable them to be a witness to Christ. The authorization to forgive sins completes the events. So we can see in just a few short verses, a lot has happened, isn't it? It's very quick to read. It's very easy to quickly read that and not take on board what's just happened. But there was a lot that had happened. And then we come to Thomas. I couldn't find out what Thomas's occupation was. I read that he was a fisherman. I read that he was a carpenter. I read that they didn't know. So we don't know. But whatever he was, most of us associate Thomas with the word doubting, don't we? He got dubbed with the name of doubting. Thomas hadn't been in that locked room when Jesus appeared. We know that at some point during the week, the other disciples would have met him and they would have told him that they had seen the risen Lord. They were full of the Holy Spirit. They would have been quite animated. Everybody else seems to have seen Jesus. How do you think you would have reacted? Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. I don't read that as an arrogant remark. I get a sense of Thomas's heart and perhaps a sense of being inquisitive. If you kind of put yourself in that situation, everyone's coming at you. They've seen Jesus and you haven't. You must be thinking, I need to see this for myself. (laughs) And it's almost like what was in his head came out of his mouth. I mean, all the time. (laughs) But a week later, when the doors of the room were shut, Jesus once again comes and stands amongst them. But this time, he speaks directly to Thomas. Put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hands and put it in my side. Don't doubt, but believe. I find that really overwhelming. (laughs) Because how would you react if Jesus came and, and, and said that to you? It's really powerful, isn't it? And I kind of thought, wow, 
He came back for Thomas. But did he? Was it just Thomas that Jesus came back for? Or was it for all humanity? Was it for all the doubters? He was saying to Thomas, investigate for yourself. Test the evidence. I've got nothing to hide. I've got nothing to cover up. I haven't got any issues to evade. And I've got nothing to avoid. That's no different for today, is it? You know, our faith is about discovering it for yourself. It's about trying it. It's about testing it. My Lord and my God was Thomas's reply. Acceptance. Have you believed because you have seen me, Jesus said. And he announces that those who have not seen and yet have come to believe are blessed. That's us. I don't know about you, but I don't feel very blessed some days. (laughs) But scripture says different. Scripture says we are blessed because we choose to believe. Do we assume that faith came easily to the disciples or did it take the appearance of the risen Jesus? That's a really interesting question, isn't it? Thomas insisted on a bit more than hearsay. And was that wrong? What does it take for people to believe in our time? And it kind of leads me back to the words of Jesus, that we are blessed because we have not seen, and yet we believe. Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we live by faith and not by sight. It's a really powerful scripture. It's a really good one to remember, isn't it? But what do we do with all of this? However lovely it is to bring scripture alive, (laughs) however lovely it is to bring it from a flat black and white to a 3D color, if we don't do something with it, it's just a story, isn't it? It's, It's just a nice something that is almost entertaining to an extent. We need to be hungry for what it's saying to us. We need to be hungry for what scripture is saying. And we need to go away from services and Bible study and seminars and the things that we we go to with an appetite. As most of us know, when we've got an appetite, we don't have a problem feeding it, do we? But what are you eating spiritually? When you leave church today, what's going to be on your menu this week? You know, we look in our empty cupboards and our fridges and our freezers, and we know exactly what's going in there, don't we? But what are you doing about the empty parts of you? What are you filling them with on a spiritual level? The remarkable thing is, is that when we take the time to look at the disciples, we see a journey. And this passage starts them off, so to speak. A journey from fear and doubt to courage and assurance. From application to transformation. From death to life. After Thomas's doubts were erased by touching Jesus' wounds, he became a fearless preacher of the gospel and a builder of churches. <clears throat> he spent a long time in India. How did he get to India? <laughs> I mean, you know, today we travel around the world at a click of a button, don't we? We could go home today and and book a flight to India and we could be on a plane tomorrow and all of us would be moaning about the eight or nine hours it took to get there, wouldn't we? But how many months did it take Thomas to get to India? How did he do that? What happened to him on the way? Where did he stop? Who did he talk to? What happened to him? Journey. 
He was martyred in India by a local king who condemned Thomas to death. I guess he didn't like what he was preaching. But I don't think Thomas died doubting. You know, take the time. I've written down here, take the time this week, but take the time this year to go and find out about the other disciples' journey because where they started was not where they finished. Are you living in the freedom and the joy of the resurrection or are you living behind locked doors? If we go back to the room the disciples had locked themselves into, is it speaking about more than a physical house with walls and doors? Or is it describing the interior condition of the disciples? The locked places in our lives are always more about what's going on inside of us than what's going on around us. Some really tough questions here. And I'm going to refer to them as you, but I certainly include myself. What are the locked places of your life? What keeps you in the tomb? Is it fear like the disciples? Maybe it's questions. Maybe you've got too many questions. Maybe you're sitting here today wondering if you're a Christian. Maybe you're doubting what your faith is. Perhaps there's sorrow and joy, uh, uh, perhaps there's sorrow and loss. Maybe wounds that you think are so deep, it doesn't actually seem worth unlocking the door and stepping outside. You know, for some of us, there is an unwillingness to open up to new possibilities and changes. Jesus is always entering those locked places of our lives. Unexpected, uninvited, and sometimes unwanted. He steps into our closed lives, our closed hearts, our closed minds. Standing among us, he offers peace and he breathes new life into us if we want it. He doesn't open the doors, but he gives us all that we need so that we might open the doors to a new life, a new creation, a new way of being, but it's a choice. Regardless of the circumstances, Jesus shows up, offering life. Life and peace are resurrection reality. Does it stop the storms? No. No. Do the hungry still need to be fed? Yeah, they do. When we, by faith, with courage, unlock the doors of our lives and tentatively step out, sometimes in fear, sometimes with lots of doubt, we're actually opening ourselves up to the possibilities and the promises that God has for us. You know, don't shut your eyes to the reality that life can be different. Don't lock out words of faith and hope and love and don't think things can't change. We live in this uber-fast world where expectation is instant. But our journey with God isn't instant. It's not fast. In fact, sometimes it's incredibly slow and painful. Anybody that knows me knows that I'm quite a fan of Joyce Meyer. She just changed my faith years ago. And um, she has this amazing saying. She says, you have to go through to get through. You know, we're not talking about McDonald's here. Our journey is not a drive-through to get what we want. It's, it's a journey of humbling ourselves. It's, it's sacrificial. 
It's yielding. It's obeying and it's learning patience. And it's not for the faint-hearted. Do you think the disciples had to deal with all of this? Yeah, I do. The transformation from fear to courage was accomplished first by Christ's personal visit in graciously dealing with the disciples, not as their sins and their behavior deserved, but by reassuring them with his word and proof of authenticity, by further commissioning them to carry on his work in the world, and by enabling them through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In that room, in that locked room, the appearance, the commissioning, the breathing of the Holy Spirit upon them, Jesus was asking them to run the race of discipleship. Go, go and run the race that I set before you. It's the London Marathon today. Last year, over 386,000 people applied to run the marathon. 58% of runners who applied from the UK had never run a marathon before. Mad. Nuts. There's 40,000 people running today. Mad. I'm not sure if the human body is built to run 26 miles. I don't think mine is. Um, (laughs) But the majority of those taking part today will have been on a journey. They would have trained. They would have pushed themselves. They would have been through varying degrees of physical pain and mental pain. There would have been days when it would have been, yes. (laughs) There would have been days when, I don't know if I can do this. They would have committed and persevered. And they would know what endurance means. Today is the ultimate endurance test, isn't it? (laughs) Today, they will be individuals who run together. On their journey today, they will uphold each other. They will come alongside strangers who are in need of help. They will encounter people who need encouraging to carry on. Some will need lifting up mentally, some physically. There will be tears of joy and pain. But each one is running the race for something good. Most will be running for charities for a charity to continue a good work. They're not all superhuman. There will be those who run today with physical disabilities and mental disabilities. They're not all perfect. They come in all shapes and all different sizes and with all different abilities, but each with a passion to complete the race. Will you run the race? that Jesus sets before you.